I'd like you to quote Psalm 1, 1 through 3 with me. Do you think you can do that? You should know this from Sunday school uh, way back when. Psalm 1, 1 through 3 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth its fruit in its season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. I think that's one through three. It might be one through four, but that's what I wanted to, wanted to uh, quote here. Our theme this year should be a slide up there, guys. Um, could you put the slide up there? Thank you. Our theme this year is living that kind of life, that Psalm 1 life in a Psalm 2 world. And if you think of Psalm 2, I'll read you the first few verses. This is not where we'll be tonight, but Psalm 2 says, Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his, hot, in his displeasure. Yet have I set my king on my holy hill of Zion. So you have the nations in this psalm raging. Uh, they are enraged about something. And it, the content of what they're enraged about is found in verse 3. And you could put this as the summary of every liberal Supreme Court decision, every liberal politician's platform, uh, the, the platform of a particular party of the United States of America um, is basically, let us break their bands and sunder and cast away their cords from us. They want freedom from God. F frankly, both political parties uh, smack of that a little bit sometimes. Um, not, not uh, uh, shouldn't be uh, critical of, of uh, one, too, too uh, over much, but it's, it's, very, it's a very wicked, wicked world in which we live. Um, but there are, there are people, and, and they, are, they are very wicked people, um, that want to throw off the, the, they call them the bonds, the cords. They feel chained. They feel restricted. They feel like they want to, to break loose and just express themselves and do what they want to do. And that's the, the world in which we live. And how are we to live a Psalm 1 type of life in that kind of world? That's what the teens have been studying all year long. And last week uh, in our teen class, we discussed how just a, an attitude toward the Scripture, like the Psalm 1 attitude, he, he delights in the law of the Lord. He doesn't, he doesn't go the way. He doesn't stand in the way of sinners, sit in the seat of the scornful. His delights in the law of the Lord, and he meditates in his law. He's like a tree planted by the rivers of water. And we, we talked about how that is something that anchors us. All year long we have talked about this drift that we, that we have toward the world and downstairs, the television is always the world, okay? And it, it's uh, the side of the world. And as, as the teens, um, as we've been in class, the, the tendency has been uh, have some teens stand up. And I'll refrain from doing that tonight. But have some teens stand up, and they'll, uh, one of them's the worldly person, and he's always got the, the non-worldly person by the arm, and he's dragging them this way, okay? And... The tendency of all of us is to drift that direction because the world is wanting to cast off God's restraints from them. And the world is in all of us. It's not necessarily all those people out there, okay? The world is inside of us as well. We have, we have a flesh that has desires, and we are told that we are not to love the world even or the things that are in the world. Because the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And that's got, a, that's got an ally in our hearts. We, we love the world if we're, if we're not careful. 
And so the drift, okay, and, and I, we talk about, well, what is this person over here that's getting dragged? What do they need to do in order not to get dragged into the world? They have to separate from this person that's dragging them toward the world. And as they separate, they always feel you will always be painted, you will always be excoriated as someone who is uncompassionate, uncaring, unloving, out of touch, and insert whatever other posting you can, you can read about that. You're always going to be labeled as someone who is a holier-than-thou person. But understand, that's, that's what the world thinks of people that want to follow Christ. We will always be misunderstood until Jesus comes. Uh, the world will never sign on to Jesus Christ until the millennium gets here, okay? And uh, it, it's not happening until Jesus comes and reign as, reigns as king here. So the tendency, though, is to drift. And we, we talked, we've talked a lot this year about the tendency of all of Christendom, all of the churches down through the centuries to drift into worldliness, to drift into doctrinal error. And I've shared some of that with, with you all up here. What is going to anchor a person? How do you stay over here when the world is lobbing grenades and pulling at you and trying to pull you down from your position? Uh, what keeps a person over here? The Word. His delight is in what? The law of the Lord. But I want to I share something with you, and I share this at the risk of being misunderstood, but I have verses for each one of these, so you shouldn't, you shouldn't misunderstand this, hopefully. Um, it's not enough to read Scripture. Let's say I'm over here, and I was like, all right, I, I got to get into my Bible. Okay, so I get up, and I'm reading, 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 reading. It's not enough to read Scripture. Is there a verse that talks about that? James 1.22, Be ye doers of the word, and not Hearers only. You could say readers only. I can't just read the word. I have to. I have to. I have to go go deeper than that. Um, I have to be a doer. And if, in order to be a doer, what do I have to? What do I have to do with the word? I have to meditate in Scripture. Okay, but I would say that even that meditating in Scripture for a New Testament Christian is a little bit short of the mark. John 5, 39, Jesus told the scribes and Pharisees who had memorized the scripture and who thought about the scripture and could tell you all the laws out to Wazoo, and they had all of the things memorized in scripture. They knew the scripture. Jesus said to them in John 5, 39, search the scriptures. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me, he said. The scriptures testify of of Jesus. It's not enough just to meditate on Scripture. You must allow, I must allow the Scripture to point you and me to Jesus. It's not enough to read. I would say carefully, again, it's not enough to meditate for a New Testament Christian. A New Testament Christian needs to connect the Scripture to one, one step further. You must allow the Scripture to point you to Jesus. And I want, you, I want to show you that in John chapter 15. John chapter 15 tonight. I'm calling this the key to a Psalm 1 life in a Psalm 2 world. Not enough to read, not enough to meditate. I have to allow Scripture to, appoint, to point us to Jesus Himself. I want to read this passage here. <clears throat> and I want you to look as we read this for references to the Word of God. Okay, you're going to see references to the vine, but tell me what the Word of God has to do with this passage. Is it has everything to do with it. I want you to see if you can find it. Verse 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not <clears throat> bear fruit, He takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, He prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the Word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me. And I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, 
and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Let's pray. Lord, please help us as we look at this passage tonight in these next few minutes. Open our eyes, Lord, to the connections here. Pray that you would uh, grant us understanding of what you have for us in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Notice how Jesus refers to the power of his words. Did you catch references to the word where do you see it first? Somebody call out a... Okay, verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you'll ask what you desire. Anywhere else? Verse 3, verse 3, it, it speaks of you're already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. So the word has something, the word that Jesus speaks has something to do here. Other parts... Okay, verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So my commandments, my word, my commandments, <clears throat> the word that I've spoken uh, to you. And not far off from here is John 17, 17. Jesus is praying for these men and he prays to his Father. He says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. He he has, it has everything to do with the Word of God. Um, Paul commands us in Colossians 3.16 to let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. So let the Word dwell. Let the Word dwell. You're clean to the Word that I've spoken to you. I want you to see here um, <clears throat> with, this, with this picture that Jesus is painting, the Word is the tool for spiritual pruning. Okay, So he's saying... He's saying, I am, he's giving them the picture. He says, I'm a vine. It's like I'm a vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So Christ is the true vine. Where are the branches? What does the branch have to do with the vine? It, <clears throat> it stays connected. It's, how is it connected? It's organically connected connected it's got grains that go into the vine and and it's you could you could put a little pressure on that you could hang something on that branch and it's not going to let go because it's grown into the vine um, <clears throat> the purpose of the branch what would you say is it's to bear fruit is there any other purpose to the branch he makes this case in Ezekiel he says branches are good for nothing unless they bear fruit you don't even burn branches they're not it's not good firewood it's good for nothing it's literally it's literally waste. Um, the purpose of the branch is to bear fruit by taking its life from the vine. And, and Christ is the vine. Who is the Father here? <clears throat> who, who is God the Father? What is God the Father's role in this situation? He's the what? Gardener. Uh, the gardener, the vine dresser, the, the husbandman King James has. Uh, he's the vine dresser. He's the, the gardener. He deals with the branches. And how does he treat the branches? Verse 2, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Now, every branch, notice those two little words, verse 2, in me. Very interesting, those two little words. People like to, people, many people say um, that, that the, the Father deals with the branches that are not bearing fruit. Some view this as cutting these branches away and disposing of them. It's a little theological uh, work that you have to do. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, cuts it off. If you're in Christ, are you a branch or not? Um, <clears throat> and it's, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting argument that, that people make there. Others interpret the Greek word here uh, meaning to, to take away. You can see in your New King James Version, there's a little marginal note there that says uh, to lift up. The word iro in the Greek can mean lift up. Um, <clears throat> and it, it could be a sense that the branch is not bearing fruit, so he lifts it up so that it can get more sunlight um, and bear fruit. Um, not here to 
to solve the mystery here. Either way um, can work <coughs> um, in the interpretation of this. What's the point? If you're not bearing fruit, God the Father is, is headed your direction, okay? And he's going to, he's going to deal with you. In, in one case, he's dealing with you in order to bear more fruit, to, to bring you up. We, we planted a little tree in a grow tube, okay? And I get nervous about the grow tube because I don't know if it's going to get enough sunlight through it. Um, <coughs> and so today, I didn't even tell my wife this. I went out and I, I put little rocks. I opened the grow tube up so that you could get some more sunlight in there because I'm worried about the tree that it's not going to get enough sunlight. Okay, and, and I, I want that sunlight to get in there to, to get to those leaves so photosynthesis can take place and everything. And you can set me straight after this if it's getting enough sunlight. That's fine. Um, but, <coughs> you know, I'm, I'm concerned about it. The father is concerned. When he sees a branch that is in trouble, he's... He's a husbandman. He is caring uh, for that branch. If a branch is bearing fruit, what is he doing with it? Okay, what is a, what is a modern day vernacular for purging it? He's going to prune it, okay? Um, if you're into this type of thing, arborists trim trees in order to shape them. Um, I've been in a lot of front yards of people from going door to door and stuff, and you notice all the different types of bushes that they have. And some of these people have amazing bushes that just, you know, they curve, and there's like nothing but the trunk. It's just all this curvy business going up, and then all, poof, you know, and it's got all these branches on it and, and this foliage and everything. It's a beautiful, beautiful tree. And you've got to know that they've been pruning and, and I don't know what all they're doing with it, but they, they have this beautiful looking tree um, that, they've, that they've shaped, as it were, as they've pruned it. And you can shape trees that way. When you cut a branch back, it causes it to put more energy into the fruit that it bears uh, rather than growing longer branches. What does the Father use to trim us, to, to prune us when we are, when we are uh, needing this pruning. When we're bearing fruit, God wants to prune us. He wants to shape us. He wants to help us bear more fruit. What is it that the Father uses to prune us, according to the next verse? The Word. You are already clean through because of the Word which I have spoken to you. The word for clean here is the same root word as prune in verse 2. Okay? Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You're already pruned because of the word which I have spoken to you. That's the sense here. So he is saying to them that the, the tool that the Father uses to prune you spiritually is none other than the Word. Now, how does that happen? How did this happen in the disciples' lives? Can you think of words that pruned the disciples? Give me some words that, that cut them down a little bit, cut them back to size. Tracy. <laughs> That's not what came to my mind first. Jesus looks at Peter, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> you don't savor the things that are of God, but those that, are be, that be of man. The word that Jesus said to Peter, you know, lopped off a few branches there, a few parts of his branch. And if Jesus had not pruned Peter, what would Peter have turned out to be? He probably would have killed people. <laughs> Peter, was, Peter was a nut, okay? And you, you know how we know that? Because we're all nuts too, okay? And, and God works on us, doesn't he? He uses his word in our lives. And you think of, you think of Peter, okay? You think of another... Another instance where Jesus had to prune these disciples. <clears throat> oh, ye of little faith. Okay. Um, how is it that you are fearful? Where is your faith? Is that what you're thinking in the Sea of Galilee? Um, it's also the Sermon on the Mount. He says, shall he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Yeah, there's, there's another situation where he's, he looks at the crowd and it includes his disciples and he says... O oh, faithless generation, perverse generation, how long shall I bear with you? How long shall I, the senses, put up with you? Um, his words are pruning them. Um, 
How about when they, when they told the little children, they said, you know, Jesus, Jesus is tired. You get, just leave Jesus alone. What does he say to his disciples? Okay, suffer the little children to come unto me. And he's clipping off the branches of his disciples. Don't you ever say that again. Don't do that. Don't do that. And he's trimming them down to size. <clears throat> they come back and they say, Lord, even the demons are subject to us through your name. He says, rejoice not that the spirits are subject to you, but rather that your names are written in the book of life. That's great that they're subject to you, but don't rejoice in that. Rejoice that your names are written in my book. Trimming them, pruning them. <clears throat> the word is the tool for spiritual pruning. You know, if you're a true branch, if you are a true branch, you will experience the Father's pruning and care whenever you effectively meditate on His Word. When you open this book up in the morning or whenever you open it up, God's going to snip, 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 snip away at your life. And there are things that are going to get in your spirit and they're going to say, you're not doing that. You're not doing that. And the little, little phrases will stick in your mind. There are, there are things that have stuck in my mind and the Lord is just snip, snip, snipping away at, at the, the branches of my life. You should look for this effect when you meditate. That's, that's what you need to be looking for when you're reading God's word is, God, you don't leave me alone. Please don't leave me alone. Make me more fruitful. Prune my life. It's not always comfortable that he does that, but you should look for that. Ask, is this passage pruning me? Is it, is it cutting away the, the wrong thinking in my life? Is there ever a sense in which the word liberates us? Just thinking of this, you know, this analogy, spinning it out a little bit. You know, if you have a tree that's, that's, that, got all, that has all these branches that are growing inward and it's all twisted up and there are branches that are dying as a result of lack of sunlight getting in. Is it, is it hurting that tree to prune that tree back? No, you're, you're really liberating that tree to grow and more effectively and more productively. And there's a sense sometimes when the Spirit of God cuts away the dead wood of your life. You, you, you hurt for a second and it's like, that feels so much better. Lord, thank you for doing that. What is the danger here of, of our attitude when God prunes away at our life? It's pretty obvious, but help me, help me flesh it out here. What is the danger when God starts to prune away at your life? What? Okay, a stiff neck. <clears throat> Resistance. No, none of us, none of us want to get trimmed back, as it were. We prefer branch length over fruit. Think of that. We prefer the length of our branch. I just want this big, long branch, you know, with all these other branches coming off, this beautiful branch, big, long branch. But God says, no, I don't want a big, long branch. Snip, 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 snip. And he's doing that so that he can get fruit. But we prefer branch length over fruit. You go to any apple orchard. Um, I know this is true of Wilson's Apple Orchard. Uh, we went down there. Whenever I want to spend tons of money, I go to Wilson's Apple Orchard. Um, I don't go there much, but um, you make memories, but spend money. Um, anyway, you go, to, you go to Wilson's Apple Orchard, go to another apple orchard, and you, you walk up these rows of apple trees, and do you think, man, what a shapely tree. What a beautiful, beautiful, so symmetrical tree. Do you ever think that of an apple tree in an orchard? Those are the ugliest trees known to man, okay? And they're just like horrendously looking apple trees. Like, how does this thing even survive, you know? They, and, but you look at the apples, the amount of apples per tree, and the apples laying on the ground, and the yellow jackets flying around on the ground, around the apples and stuff, you know? And there's all these apples, all this fruit. Why is there so much fruit on that apple tree? They have, they have taken the shears to that thing time and time and time and time again, and they have trained that thing to yield that amount of apples. The trees are not beautiful, but the fruit is. The life of a Christian, sometimes, you look at a Christian's life and it's like God is cut, 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 cut. And it's not, it's not beautiful by the world's standards. You, you say, you, you know, 
you, you did this and, di and then God gave you this trial and this trial and this trial. And there's scars perhaps, but the fruit of a faithful Christian's life is laying all over the place. The, the, the fruit of a faithful Christian's life that, that has given God the liberty to prune away at their life is abundant. So how does the pruning help us to bear fruit? How does the pruning help us to bear fruit? Well, it causes us to abide more completely in the vine. The word is the means of abiding in the vine. It's not only the tool for spiritual pruning, this passage is going to show us, the word is also the means of abiding in the vine. Um, you think of the branches of a vine. They are completely, as I said earlier, they are completely useless without the vine. A branch that is not well connected to the vine bears no fruit. Uh, without an effective and active connection to Christ, how much can we accomplish? We are totally useless without Christ. Let's say that again. Think of that. Think of the weight of that because we don't think this way all the time. Without Jesus Christ pulsating through our life, where people can look at us and they can see you're obviously connected to Jesus Christ. He is obviously running your life. Without that, what value is your life? It is useless. I didn't say it, God did. Without me, ye can do how much? Nothing. Nothing. Without an active connection to Christ, we can do nothing. Branches that bear no fruit are useless to the point of cutting them off and burning. Look at, um, look at verse 4. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. And again, here, the analogy, I think Jesus is just painting an analogy, painting a picture here. I personally don't believe that he's seeking to teach um, about the doctrine of eternal punishment necessarily here. I think it's just a detail to the analogy. Um, is it true that if you were never connected to Christ and you never bear fruit and you never believed on Christ, where will you go? You will be gathered and you will be burned. And that is definitely true. You could, you could make that case very strongly from other passages. Um, I think here... Uh, the, the context seems to say that, that this is just a, a detail like, like, the, um, like the birds of, of heaven coming and nesting in the branches of, the, of the, the mustard seed that grows up into a mighty tree and the birds of heaven come. People try to make that into things that it's not. The birds of heaven. What are the birds of heaven? Well, they obviously are the Gentiles because this bird is representative of this nation and this bird is this nation and... Jesus was just telling a story. <laughs> a story is generally meant to, in, to illustrate one thing of, of this nature. So um, I, that's my own personal take on this. Um, I believe that he's painting the metaphor brightly, um, as he often did. Branches that abide in the vine bear much fruit. Branches that abide in the vine bear much fruit. Verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. There it is. What abides in us? His words. If you stay, this, the sense of abide is to stay, to remain in me, and my words stay, remain in you. You'll bear much fruit. You'll ask what you will, he says, and it shall be done for you. When we do this, when, we, when Christ's words abide in us, we will share Christ's will in our prayer lives, and Christ will answer when you are thinking God's thoughts, that's the sense here of what he's meaning. My words abide in you. What do you think about all day? What do you th I, you, I know what you're thinking about now. I, say, I know what I hope you're thinking about right now. Um, but what do you think about all day long? What goes through your mind continually all day long? Now, I realize you can't literally walk around with your Bible in front of you, you know, mumbling to yourself. But how often does God's word come into your mind? How often do the things of God come into your mind? Abiding in Christ is thinking God's thoughts. 
It doesn't mean that every cracker that you have to eat, you have to compare it to some spiritual truth or every cookie that you, you get, every donut, you know, you need, to, you need to make some spiritual parallel there. It's not, that's not what we're talking about here. It's living in God's presence. Living in God's presence where God's thoughts permeate your mind. Um, where you think His thoughts after Him. You think of His beauty. You praise Him for His beauty. You praise Him for His, his faithfulness. What do you think Jesus did when he saw flowers? Was he? Did he did he bend over and sniff them? Did he enjoy them? Was he impressed by them? I think I think Jesus was like us. He was a human. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. Are you guys sure of that? You guys awake tonight? Okay. Yeah. Jesus was a human. When Jesus saw flowers, when Jesus saw his creation, I believe Jesus took the time and he gloried in his creation. He, he was pleased by it. When God made his creation, what did he say after every single day? It's good. God saw this, he said it's good. God likes his creation. He's not like, those flowers are boring. You know, he, doesn't, he doesn't say that. He, he, is, he enjoys what he makes. He delights over us in song, the Bible says. What am I saying? When Jesus was here on earth, he lived life as God intended life to be lived. And I believe Jesus enjoyed the things of life. What did Jesus think about all day? I believe Jesus, Jesus thought about the things we think about. He's, he went to get food. He, uh, he um, enjoyed the flowers. He, he worked. He helped. He, he had to think about how to saw this board correctly. He had to think about how to fit this stone in this, in this, this uh, place here. He had to solve problems. Jesus had to think like we do. But he thought perfectly. And all I'm saying is, when you are living this life, Jesus says, I want you to abide in me and let me, my words, abide in you. Think like I do. How would Jesus do what you're doing? Our attitude in this regard is, is displayed by how we treat God's words. When we abide in Christ by allowing His words to abide in us, to live in us. And our attitude toward the Word must be more than just 15 minutes of reading sometime during the day. Hadn't it? If you get up in the morning and you spend 15 minutes and you think about God's Word, I... Go for it. That's great. But that is that enough? Is that enough? Should shouldn't you think about God throughout the day? Like shouldn't you shouldn't you be in God's presence? Shouldn't you allow His Word to abide in you? If you're going to bear fruit, how many times, if a branch could think, think, imagine with me, how many times would a branch request food from the vine? Does it ever stop requesting food from the vine? Never. It's constantly, there's, I don't know how it works, but there's a, there's a draw there from the branch. It takes what it needs from the vine continually. That ought to be our attitude toward God. As newborn babes, what are we supposed to do? Desire. That's a command. We, we sort of, in the, when we memorize that, at least when I remember, memorized it, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow there. I didn't quite get the sense of that sentence. As newborn babes, desire, crave would be a good word. Crave the sincere milk of the word. That should be your attitude towards the word. You need to crave it. When Caitlin is hungry, you can give her a pacifier for a little bit. You can give her her little shaky toy for a little bit. And you can try to distract her, but it comes a point where it just it's all for naught. And she, she gets this face of discouragement, you know, where it's just like her cry changes from like, okay, this is annoying, to I am surrounded by people who are incompetent. That's sort of what her cry means. I am surrounded by incompetence. And she's discouraged about it. Doesn't get that way often because we're, we get wise to it. But um, she, she just, she wants food. And, and before she gets it, she gets this cry every time. <laughs> she's crying continually and she, she's craving food. That's how you should be when, you don't, when you're not able to get the Word of God. You should crave the Word of God. Is that your attitude? Is that my attitude? 
It's vital to our usefulness. It's the means by which we take our life from Christ. It reveals the intensity of our love for Christ. Jesus said, if you love me, what? If you love me, keep my commandments, John 14, 15. The word needs to shape our very existence. We cannot do this without some help. You say, how am I going to crave that? How am I going to, how am I going to have that emotion even? Like, am I going to find the time for that? You have a helper, don't you? What's his name? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is with us. Jesus has sent his Holy Spirit to aid us in this. Continue, he says, in my love. And, and he wants us to, to depend on the Holy Spirit. John 16, I don't have time to, to uh, expound all of this, but the comforter that he pr- promises to send will guide you into all truth. He'll take of mine and show it unto you. The Holy Spirit reminds us of these things. And what's the end of all this? Look at verse 11, John 15, 11. These things have I spoken to you that you may be miserable for all of your days. No, what does he say? Verse 11. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Jesus says you're not happy enough. Do you know God wants you to be happy and joyful? Away with this notion that we should be miserable as Christians. We are not supposed to be miserable. What kind of advertisement is that for God? God wants you to be joyful. He wants you to be thrilled at His presence. He wants you to be thrilled with Him. These things have I spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. He says, you're not joyful enough. You're not, you're not fulfilled enough. So allow me to remain in you at all times. If, I just want to say this. If you, in your mind right now, are thinking, that's nice, Pastor Wes. You have to say that because you're standing up there and you're preaching from John 15. But if, if you don't really believe that abiding in Christ continually is joyful, you are missing out. The closest I have felt to God in my lifetimes, in my lifetime, has been when I am the most joy filled. And I think many of you could bear testimony to that as well. When are you the happiest of your life? I have asked teens this that have come to me for counseling that are struggling with giving something up. And I've said, when have you been the happiest? And they always go back, well, when I, at camp, when I did this, or when I gave this to God, like, why don't you just go back there? And they, they say things, oh, I, just, I just feel like it's going to be miserable. And we tell ourselves the dumbest lies. Sorry, we, we do. We're, we're just... Frankly, we're dumb sometimes. You know, we're, we're just, we're not intelligent spiritually. God, God wants us to be happy. He wants us to be joyful. I'm not saying we're always just flitting around like butterflies uh, from flower to flower, okay? But I'm, I'm saying there are times where trials, but in, in trials we have joy. And God says, I want, I want my joy to remain in you and your joy to be full. What's the secret? Don't leave Jesus. Don't. Don't leave Jesus for anything. If you feel yourself near to Christ and something else begins to pull you away, look at that something else and identify it as an idol. Because that's what it is. You say, well, it's it's something really good. Well, it's an idol. And get get your perspective right on it. Jesus wants your joy to be full in Him. It's not enough to read Scripture. It's not enough to even meditate in Scripture. Scripture is the pruning shears that God uses to cause us to abide in Christ even more. And it's not only the pruning shears, it is the means by which we abide in Christ. We abide in Christ by letting His Word abide in us, by thinking His thoughts after Him. We have to allow the Scripture to point us to Jesus. Christianity is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We think of Christianity as this lifestyle, okay? And we make it too complicated. What is Christianity? It's Christ in you, the hope of glory, Colossians tells us. I'm reading the biography of George Whitfield right now by Arnold Dallimore. I would heartily 
recommend that biography to you. And Whitfield was a member of what was called the Holy Club at Oxford. Sound like the club you'd want to be involved in? Um, its members were, were high-profile men that we would respect today. He was, he was members of this club with John and Charles Wesley. But there was one problem. The Holy Club did not know Jesus like none of them did. The Holy Club uh, was a group of men that they were very fastidious in their schedules. They tried not to waste a single moment of the day. They tried to resist anything that was tempting. They tried to be just as, as devoted to the Lord as they could. And their hope was that they would obtain eternal life by strict discipline. It nearly killed George Whitfield. He became, he became so ascetic that he... He, he felt like he needed to give up everything that brought him joy. So he gave, up, he gave up everything. And then he's like, well, I need to give up the Holy Club too because it brings me joy. So he gave up the Holy Club. And he didn't hang out with his friends anymore. And he got so sick, he nearly died. They had to lay him in bed for months and nurse him back to health because he had been so uh, rigorously um, ascetic and just abstained from all these different things, including food. And... Whitfield, at some point, read a book by Henry Skugel, and you can buy it on Amazon. I have not read it, um, but it's called The Life of God and the Soul of Man. And Whitfield said that that book basically changed his life. And what Henry Skugel wrote in that book was that salvation came only from union with Christ. Christ needs to be in you, and you need to be in Christ. The life of God in the soul of man. The title of the book says it all. And that was his premise, that eternal life is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And Whitfield, at some point, as he, as he meditated on that and, and different circumstances came to pass, the Lord brought Whitfield to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And he began to preach. And he preached, and it's amazing how the Lord used the life of George Whitfield. Tens of thousands of people heard the gospel before the modern amplification system. Whitfield would preach across the decks of three ships in his lifetime. The two ships would pull up as he was getting ready to sail. And across these three decks, the sailors were all standing there, sitting there, and he would preach to these men. And uh, just a, an amazing man that God used in a great way. But it all began when Whitfield came to the end of himself and he, he discovered, I need the life of God in my soul. And it's a challenge. I want to challenge particularly the teens tonight. Um, you will not make it any other way. You will not make it in your life without the life of God in your soul. And I hope that you've trusted Christ um, as your Savior. I hope that you know him personally tonight. But if you are not experiencing the life of Jesus within your soul, you're missing out on something tonight. Adults as well. We, we can miss out on this. We can, we can access this and we can get all busy and all distracted and we can miss out on this. Christianity is about the life of God in the soul of man. And how do we access that? Through the Word. It, it all has to do with the Word, our attitude toward the Word. You see how important your Bible reading is. I'm going to say this carefully. If you're just checking boxes off, throw the plan out the window. Okay? Did I say that actually? Throw the plan out the window. Throw it out the window if it's getting legalistic. Read the Bible for a different reason. Don't just, don't just check boxes off. Read to see. Read to abide in Christ. And and. I've, I've done this. I, I did this this morning. I read my Bible reading plan and I got my check. I was like, still not, still didn't do anything. Lord, you're going to have to, you're going to have to help me. And, and I read something else. And, and God, God used first Timothy in my heart this morning. And, and he, he, he shaped my life from first Timothy. That wasn't in my plan. Okay. And I'm saying, if your plan's not working, get another plan. Okay. Cause it's all the word. Okay, read the Word, but don't shortchange yourself. Don't be just checking boxes off. Abide in Christ through reading His Word. Let's pray. Lord, thank You for reminders like this, so desperately needed in our lives. Lord, I pray for our 
time and our attitude towards your word. I pray more for our attitude towards your word. Lord, help us to crave it. Help us to think those thoughts. I pray that we would, we would be shaped by those words. Lord, that you would prune our lives, that you would cut away the things that need to be cut away through our time in your word. Lord, help us not to prefer a lengthy branch to a fruitful branch. May we crave the fruit that comes from the pruning of your word. Help us to abide in you. Lord, teach each person here, Lord, whatever the next step is for them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I have no 